This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. As happens so quite often, you begin to notice something that people that just love your church and they can't say enough about it and they brag about it and tell their friends about it and then after a while they begin to come less and less and they don't come in on time, they come in later, they don't sit toward the front, they sit toward the middle and eventually sit toward the back and where they used to come early, now they come late and they leave early. And by the time you say bow your heads for an altar call, they're up and out the door. If you ever get a chance to question them, they'll just tell you, well, life has become so busy. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome back again to Student of the Word of God. And I'm glad, so glad you're here today and we're taking up a series. We've been in the midst of a series teaching about the importance of the local church and the importance of the Word of God in your life. This is really directed more toward ministers, but again, no matter what section of the, of the scripture you open up to, everybody benefits from it. And so even the ones in Timothy, Titus, often again, those are designated as pastoral epistles, but yet the scriptures in there are true for everybody, such as study to show yourself approved unto God, and that the whole of the Word of God is given by inspiration of God and profitable. All these things are well, great for everyone, but Paul did write those specifically to ministers. What I'm doing is I'm speaking to ministers, but this overflow is incredible. We began with the parable of the sower and the seed, and we start out really talking about the importance of church, the importance of coming to church. And then we took up the importance of the Word of God, that thing which is so important in every part of our life. You see, it's the new birth that gets us into the family of God, but it really has very little to do with the Word. Really, the new birth has everything to do with accepting the Lordship of Jesus. After that, we go to the Word of God for growth. Jesus said to those Jews who just believed in Him, while He was preaching, many accepted Him as Savior. He then stopped and spoke to them and says, if you continue in my Word, then are you my disciples indeed. This is where we began. In the book of Acts chapter 2, when the church began there, toward the end of the chapter, it says they, those the 3,000 that just received Jesus, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Again, we covered that. They had to go to the place where the, doc, where the apostles were. That's where they got the doctrine, so they didn't forsake the assembling of themselves together. Then they continued steadfastly again in fellowship, prayers, and breaking of bread. There's a fellowship that goes with it, a breaking of bread, eating meals at the church, and then also prayers, different types of prayers. So they spent a lot of time at the church. Seem like today people are spending less and less time at church. There's so much more to do. We become lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. We spend more on boats and cars and, re and, and all kinds of recreational things and going to movies and out to eat and all that, which is fine. Just don't put them ahead of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Let the Word of God going to church be the highest priority of your life. And that's what we've dealt with. So we also pointed out in the parable of the sower and the seed that really this one out of Mark chapter 4 is dealing with the local church. And really the, the one that scatters the seed there is not Jesus. Although in Matthew 13, he is the one that scatters the seed in that parable. And that's the parable of the seed and of the tares, uh, the wheat and the tares. And so again, that's mentioned that that's evangelism. But this is not evangelism. This particular passage of scripture is the word of God being sown to the hearts of believers. So all four times, types of ground are believers. And we had the hard ground, the stony ground. That's what we've covered so far. Today, we're going to take up the thorny ground. And remember, the ways that Satan steals the word is the way he gets you out of church. The very first one was hard ground, and Satan came immediately and stole the seed. The next one was stony ground, and there we found out it didn't take much root, and they became offended. And offenses is the number one reason why people leave church. And we took that up last time. And we ended talking about all the different things people get offended over. Remember again, an offense is a molehill that gets magnified into a mountain. What do I mean by that? It's got to do with carpet colors, wall colors, nothing to do with the Word of God. It's all these little petty things that people say. It's too cold in here. It's too hot in here. Uh, the, we sing too much music. We don't have enough music. The music's too loud. The music's not loud enough. Uh, I don't like the parking lot. I had to park in the gravel today, and I don't, I'd rather park on hard parking lot. And again, our problem 
problems are nothing compared to problems of the world where people walk great distances to go to church. Their buildings are not that good, but the Word of God should remain the best. And so today we're taking up the subject, the third type of ground out of Mark chapter 4. We're taking up the issue of thorny ground. I want to go back to our key verse. Our key verse was 30, 23 through 25 of this particular chapter. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. The, he, the Greek actually says, keep on hearing. And he said to him, take heed what you do here. With what measure you measure out, it shall be measured to you. And to you who hear or keep on hearing shall more be given. For he who has, that is ears that keep on hearing, to him more shall be given. And he who has not ears that keep on hearing, from him shall be taken even that which he has. We pointed out in this parable that the key issue of this parable is not God who gives or Satan who steals. It's not the demons, the birds that come and steal the seed. The issue is not the seed. We have uh, we have things in here that are not variables. They're, they're constants. God is a constant. Satan is a constant. The Word is a constant. And the sower is a constant. The one that is not a con constant in here and really of which the whole parable hinges on is the ground. And your heart is the ground. You make up the difference. Again, God can't force it on you and Satan can't come and intentionally steal it from you. They need your permission. And that's why ground that keeps on hearing continues to be blessed and God keeps on giving. The moment you stop hearing, Satan comes and steals from you. And again, Satan can't create anything. He can only steal what God gives to you. The revelations, the goodness, the blessings of life that come with the Word of God, Satan can start to steal those from you when you quit hearing. So the key is here, keep on hearing, and that's the difference between each ground. Each ground hurt a little bit longer than the ground before it, before they gave up, and we're going to eventually get to, in the next one, this one or the next broadcast, into the ground that was the good ground that just kept on producing. You know what this ground is? 30, 60, to 100 fold, no matter what the adversity, no matter what happened around them, no matter if there was church splits, no matter if the pastor ran off with his secretary, no matter if somebody in the church stole money, it really came down to this. God hasn't fallen off the throne. Jesus is still there. The word is still important. And we have to get our eyes past people. People will always let us down at one point or another, but God never will. So the issue there is keep on hearing, keep on hearing, keep on hearing. Have a heart that keeps on hearing, an ear that keeps on hearing. And if you do, you'll bypass and go past the hard ground, the stony ground, past the thorny ground to good ground, and then keep on increasing as good ground 30, 60, and 100 fold. Again, that verse was the key verse, and the key verse is have ears that keep on hearing. Yeah, but so-and-so just keep on hearing. Yeah, but the church down the street keep on hearing. But my kids keep on hearing. My wife said keep on hearing. All that I'm saying is don't let all these outside things influence you. Keep on hearing the Word of God. Why were they successful? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What did Jesus say? If you continue in my word. That's a decision, a choice you have to make to do that from the word of God. Let's go to verse 18 of Mark chapter 4. And here we get into the third type of ground, which is thorny ground. And these are those which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares or the necessities of this world. The Greek word ion means age. The necessities of this age and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful, which means no ability to produce. In the other types of ground, Satan stole them. Immediately, the second one, what happened was people became offended. In this one, Satan has to get really crafty, so he waits for the Word to start producing in your life. And blessings begin to come along, and finances begin to come along. And where you had bad health, now God's healing power is starting to minister in your life. Where you had financial problems, now they're starting to work out. And in so doing, in this case, here's what happens. It says, all of a sudden, the necessities of this age, the deceitfulness of riches. I want you to notice riches aren't wrong. It's the deceitfulness of riches that is wrong. And the deceitfulness of riches and then the lusts for other things. You can't stop lusting. Your attention has been taken off the Word onto what the Word will produce. In the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, it says this, that the Word of God is like a beautiful woman. And it says, and she comes and in her right hand is length of days in her left hand is riches and honor. And then it tells us later, don't turn from the right hand or the left. You stay after the beautiful woman. You stay after the word of God and she'll keep coming complete with long life in her right hand and, and length of, and uh, riches and honor in her left hand. What the word is simply saying is stick with the word. Don't bite, don't get caught up in one side or another. And I've had this happen so often, but again, this verse tells us 
that there comes. The first one was passing the offense test, the difficulty test, the trials, the necessity of Satan coming to steal the Word. Once you recognize all these trials are coming into my life because I've gotten into the Word of God, not because I'm talented, not because I'm good looking, not because my family is a threat to Satan's kingdom. It's because the Word you've taken in. Satan hates the Word. And this is what we need to use to fight back at him. Once you realize that, Satan will shift over and he'll start using blessings as an attack in your life and starting to say, well, look, there's no reason now to keep going to church. Look, I mean, your, your bank account's full. Your house is, is your, pa- your payments are there. And oh, look at all the wonderful blessings you have around you. And you just bought a new car. How about driving it on Sunday or a boat? Oh, that's a good one. Drive your boat on Sunday. He's simply saying that he'll use the things of this world and the blessings of this world to draw your attention away from the Word of God. And this also becomes a major reason why that people leave church and leave the Word of God. This particular part of the parable is so important that Jesus actually taught another parable on this one type of ground. And let's go ahead and turn to that. It's Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Throughout the Word of God, many had a difficult time passing the uh, prosperity tests. And again, we have it. Adversity tests come from the devil. But really, ultimately, prosperity comes as Satan uses what God has given us to test us. And it's just like in the garden, has really God said, all these blessings again come at us. The prosperity test really ultimately starts with God himself as he blesses us and really says to us, the blessings I give to you, will you keep your eyes on me? Will you keep your attention on me? And there's more blessings where this came from because I'm looking for people I can trust. So it comes back to this. Are you willing to keep God first and continue to keep on giving into his kingdom? Abraham's son Isaac was offered and put on the altar. God asked the best of him and he gave the best and kept on serving God. And the end was even better after that. Luke chapter 14, in this particular parable, Jesus is giving to the people the, in, in a parable about the local church. It's what's really going to be taking over from the time that Israel goes under and on the day of Pentecost, the local church begins and the universal church begins. This is God's vehicle in the earth for spreading first of all the gospel and next of all the word. And so again, uh, the twofold uh, prongs of evangelism is first becoming a convert and next of all becoming a disciple. The major reason for the local church is to make disciples out of converts. Disciples can go out and make the best witnesses because why? The purpose of the local church is mainly for the building up of the saints to go do the work of the ministry. And so in Luke chapter 14, Jesus is going to come back and give a parable about the local church and why it's so important that we stick with it and the tools that Satan uses in especially prosperity and the blessings of life to try to draw us away from church and become more self-dependent. And that's why, again, we quoted here earlier in this particular segment on that in the day we're living in, is that the love of riches, the love of other things come and choke the Word of God. And what we're talking about here is prosperity can become a tool that Satan uses against us. And so we're living in a day when people are more lovers of pleasures than they are lovers of God. And God wants to be lovers of Him, lovers of God. And that way the pleasures just can keep on coming because no good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. When we come back after the break, we're going to take up with this parable in Luke chapter 14. And I know you're going to be blessed. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, Visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. In Luke chapter 14, this is where we left off, we're coming to. In this particular parable, we're going to talk about the local church. And many applications can be made from these parables, but I believe the real translation of this comes back to tying in with Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower and the seed. And this one has to do with that third type of ground. That's the thorny ground of which the overwhelming blessings of life eventually draw people away from church. And so here beginning in verse 16, we're going to read down from verse 16 down to verse 27. 
And here it says, then he said to him, this is to a man that questioned Jesus. He said to him, a certain man made a great supper and invited many to come. In this one, I believe that really what this is saying is, and I have some others that back me up on this particular one in, in some books I have read and also other ministers. Listen to this. The certain man that made the great supper is the pastor. I know that Jesus makes a great supper and ultimately he supplies all the food for us, but there has to be somebody that prepares it and that's the pastor. He goes and gets the raw meat from the word of God, the raw vegetables from the word of God, all these things and puts them together and makes a meal every time the people come together. I want you, says it said, a certain man made a great supper. This has to do with the sermons that the pastor prepares. Pastors don't throw in something into a microwave oven on Saturday night so you can preach it on Sunday morning. Don't go looking as you can on today on the internet and find sermons already prepared for you that somebody else has preached and you preach their sermons. No, this sermon says you need to prepare a great meal. Any woman will tell you to prepare a great meal takes a great amount of time. Thanksgiving meal does not start on Thanksgiving evening, all right, or the, or the, or the evening before. It doesn't start on Thanksgiving Eve. What happens is you actually start planning it for quite a few weeks and you have to go buy things, you know, all the, and then there's the laying out because no two foods get done at the same time. How women get those things to the table all at the same time is incredible. And so there's a great meal prepared. One thing I have seen about Thanksgiving meals is this. It takes a long time to prepare, but boy, does it take a short time to eat it. And I mean, you take days to prepare it, get it out there, and the women are so proud, but I mean, in 20, 25 minutes, all the food has been eaten. And so that's the way church is. Pastors, you're going to make yourselves great meals. It's going to take you days to prepare it. I mean, sometimes even weeks. There's times as a pastor, I was studying weeks ahead for a series I would be teaching, putting a lot of time into it. And by the time I taught that sermon, I mean, people would gobble it up, come after church and say, wow, that was a, that was a great sermon. Well, my whole thing. Well, then go buy a CD of it. That way you could take some leftovers home and they could hear it again. So again, this is important. And so in this verse of scripture again, it says he made a great supper and invited many. So the inviting of many is the time the door is opened up and the pastor invites and people invite and people come in and you invite your friends in for this meal that's about to be served. It says, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuses the first said, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I pray, have thee me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to test them. I pray, have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife and I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the halt and the blind. The things that's brought up here is when the minister invited everybody to come and uh, they have come regularly before, but all of a sudden people begin to trail off and the faithful ones quit coming as often as happens so quite often. You begin to no notice something that people that just love your church and they can't say enough about it and they brag about it and tell their friends about it. And then after a while, they begin to come less and less and they don't come in on time. They come in later. They don't sit toward the front. They sit toward the middle and eventually sit toward the back and where they used to come early, now they come late and they leave early. And by the time you say, bow your heads for an altar call, they're up and out the door. If you ever get a chance to question, them, they'll just tell you, well, life has become so busy. Well, why is it so busy you can't come to church? The very thing that got you the prosperity that's making you busy is the thing you're turning from. It's God that says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above. It's the Lord that wants to bless you coming in and going out. But why? How does it start? By being faithful to his word, believing his word. And that comes again mainly from the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the local church you attend. And it says that servant came and again told him what happened. And he said, those that were bidden, he said, they have now given excuses why they can't come. I want you to notice what they offered. They didn't offer reasons. They offered excuses. A reason is the truth. An excuse is a lie. An excuse covers up your own weaknesses. It never, it's not a thing where you're even honest about the situation. And here's what they begin to say with one. The first one said, I have bought a piece of ground. I need to go see it. Well, what kind of idiot would buy a piece of ground and then go look at it? I mean, that's the way you end up with swampland in some place in the United States. Then somebody sold it and, and ripped you off. You never went to see it. And this man said, I bought it. Now I'm going to go take a look at it. This is just an excuse. On top of that, if you just bought a piece of ground and have to go look at it, why does it have to be on Sunday morning? Why not late Sunday afternoon or Monday afternoon? You've got, you've got six other days of the week or even six and a half days out of the week that you can go look at it. 
Why does it have to be at the very same time that church is going on? On top of that, where did this man get the prosperity to buy the piece of property? Again, there's nothing wrong with buying a piece of property. The, the minister here didn't say that's an evil thing to do. No, what he wants to know is why is this thing suddenly standing in the way of you coming to church? Before this, nothing stood in the way of you coming to church. I had a man come to me one time who listened to me on the radio and came and told me, he said, I want to start coming to this church. He said, I really he said, man, I am broke. My business has gone bankrupt. He said, I am very, very close to declaring bankruptcy totally in my life. And he says, I'm, I want the word of God. And he says, I realized something. I need the word. And so uh, before he left, he bought just a few books that morning before he left, after he came to see me and talked to me, he came to our church. And I mean, was he ever faithful? He was faithful. Sat down to the front row. And I mean, through the weeks, he started giving into the offering. He started listening to the word of God. He started buying materials and reading the Word of God. He would come with questions after church, and this man grew. And I mean, in a matter of five to six months, he was no longer declaring bankruptcy. God had brought extra income into his life, and he was just squeaking by. And But he was doing better than he was, and he still began to grow and increase because God's prosperity usually comes a little at a time. God wants to see if he can trust us not to turn from him and turn to the riches. So this man kept on, and one day he came to church on a Wednesday night, and he had a car and he said, I bought myself a brand new car. It was a Cadillac. Now it wasn't the top of the line Cadillac, but it was a nice one and it was brand new. And he said, you know what, pastor? He said, I, he said about 80% I paid cash for it. I only had to finance a little bit of it. He was so excited. And he said, I imagine I'm going to pay it off in just a little bit of time and all that. And I said, well, listen, I said, after church, why don't you let me ride in it? And he goes, no, no. I, he said, I can't stick around for church. I'm going to take my grandkids for a ride, my, my kids for a ride. He started naming all these people. And when he walked out the door, I thought, are you kidding? I mean, the very one who got it for you, God, the word who got it for you, you're going to now miss church to go take them for a ride. I mean, that to me is selling your birthright for a mess of pottage. I mean, that is like a bowl of soup compared to a steak meal that you're about to have at the church. And you know what? I began to think as, as he left, I said, you better be careful. I told him later, I said, you better be careful because this thing can creep in on you. And you know what? Sure enough, through the months, he began to come a little later. He began to move back a little bit. Why? Because the pressure of finances was gone. And all of a sudden, it began to outweigh the presence of God. And so this one said here again, I have bought a piece of ground. I need to go see it. I pray, have me excused. The second one said this, I bought five yoke of oxen. I need to go test them. I pray, let me be excused. Well, next of all, who would buy five yoke of oxen, then go try them out? Again, what if they're lame? What if you already paid for it and you went then to try them out and now you can't get your money back? This is, some, this, is, this is just an excuse. Notice again, they're not reasons, they are excuses. And this man is using it to cover the fact that now that the financial pressure is gone, and you know what? Five yoke of oxen represent real prosperity. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, they offered lambs and rams and turtle doves and pigeons. And turtle doves and pigeons were for the real poor to give to God. Rams and lambs were for middle class. But listen, when you offered an oxen to the Lord, you were wealthy. And this man had just bought five yoke of oxen. You realize that's 10 oxen he bought? And this guy is bragging. I mean, this is like, this is like saying, I bought myself a brand new Mercedes and this thing's the top of the line. This man really was very prosperous. But you know what he said? Now I'm going to go try it out. I'm going to try it out during church. And he said, I can't come. So have me excused. This is the one who again was faithful to attend when the doors were open, always came, never missed, shouted on the, la on the front seat the loudest, carried books home, bought the CDs, studied at his home, studied on his lunch hour, played them in the car. This is the kind of guy that grew. And all of a sudden when the pressure's gone, all of a sudden Satan says, well, you don't need to come to church that often. And he begins to listen to the devil. And this is how the devil steals the seed that's been sown. All I can say is if prosperity has turned your eyes away from the word and you don't listen to the word of God as much, then you're not continuing steadfastly in the word. And that which you have can be stolen from you. That was our key verse back in Mark chapter uh, four, verses 23 through 25. Here we have it again that the man says this, and you know what's going to happen? This man's going to lose his prosperity. And here's what happens. Oftentimes when people lose, the very things that God has given to them, they get bitter and they get mad. Blame the church, blame the pastor, instead of blaming themselves. Because remember, the word is a constant and God's a constant. Satan's a constant. The sower's a constant. It's the ground that makes the difference. And God's simply saying here that this was the thorny ground. The third one to me is such a common one. I have married a wife and I cannot come. 
I mean, I know a lot of kids that come to church and, and singles that come to church and, and divorced people that come to church. You know why? Ultimately, they're looking for a mate. I don't care. Come on to church. We have lots of mates. I'd rather you look here than in the single bars, and I'd certainly rather you look here than going to one of those dating sites, one of those websites where a computer chooses for you. Come to church where God can arrange for you to meet godly people and a girl to meet a godly guy and a guy to meet a godly girl. And again, I don't mind, okay? I, I don't know what excuse you use to come to church or what reason you use to come to church. I'm just glad you're in church because we're here there to solve your sin problems and also just the needs of life. This one met a girl, probably met her in church, and said, I've met a wife, now we're married. He says, I can't come. Now, I understand heading out on your honeymoon and, and missing church for that, but after that, come back to church, be here. And you that faithfully attended church and God brought a wife to you, get faithful to even do more in the church. Start teaching a class, teaching newlyweds. Again, things you can share from your life. But what happened was, it says he could not come, and when the servant came and told the master, the pastor of the church, the pastor got very angry and simply said that meal that was prepared for them, they're not worthy to have it right now. So he began to invite them to go out and bring in everybody, bring in here the poor, bring in here the blind. In essence, what he was saying was, I'll start all over again. The word has the power to change them. And out of the people that come in, it may happen again, but you know what? Someone's gonna stick with it. And out of the someone that sticks with it, someone's gonna start another church and someone's become a missionary. Someone's gonna turn the world upside down with financial blessings for the kingdom of God. He said, bring in here the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Mind. And in verse 22, the servant said, Lord, it is done as you have commanded and still there is room. There's always going to be room in church for more people to come. And I'm simply telling you, lay aside all your prejudices, lay aside everything else in life and make this mindset in yourself. Lord, I promise you the word of God will be number one. Because two questions God will never ask you when you get to heaven was, or two statements. Number one was that you attended church too much. And number two, you gave too much money. Understand you just can't outgive God when it comes to the blessings of life. At the dawn of the church age, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and power to his followers. From Pentecost, they were led by his Spirit to blaze a trail through the hazardous maze of pagan cultures and religious legalism. Like wildfire, the gospel spread through the known world, bringing salvation to a whole generation and triumph and trial to the church. In a New Testament commentary on Acts, Bob Yannian explores the exploits of those sent to uproot the binding vines of religion and philosophy and to sow the kingdom of God. Through evaluations of early congregations and detailed descriptions of their cities, Pastor Bob walks us through the exciting, perilous adventure of the early church. Order a New Testament commentary on Acts at bobyandian.com or call 918-250 2207. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918-250-2207. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.